We are students. Today we're going to talk about the blood vessels, histological structure of the blood vessels. This is an extremely important topic. Of course, every topic is important, but this is uh, more important, even more important, uh, because actually everywhere we have blood vessels. Almost in every slide we have blood vessels. Out of the two slides that you're going to get in the exam, one surely contains blood vessels. So. Uh, you can be 100% sure that you will be asked about blood vessels. Um, and about the basic concepts, which artery follows which and how the circulation happens um, <clears throat> in the pulmonary and systemic circulation, I'm sure you know about the basic uh, principles. I know that the letters are too small in this table, I just wanted to remind you that since there are um, differences between books, we tried to use a uniform uh, measure and you can find it in our script, in our histological script. So uh, just a reminder that you find uh, it there too. So let's see the general structure of blood vessels. As you see, this is an organ with layers. This is a holy organ with layers, with the lumen inside and the layers of the wall. So, as now we have actually finished the basic tissues, the histology of the basic tissues, now we can turn with the blood vessels, we turn to organ, to detailed histology. And as you can see, blood vessels are or can be considered as organs uh, with a wall. And as such, uh, blood vessels also have the three typical layers of any other organ. Every organ has a epithelial cell layer, then a smooth muscle layer, and then connective tissue. And basically we find the same thing here in the blood vessels. We have the intima, media, and adventitia layers, or you can say tunica, intima, tunica, meaning layer. Tunica intima, tunica media, and tunica adventitia. In some books they call it externa as the outer layer. The intima always contains the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells make the epithelial lining of all blood vessels. Without endothelium we don't have a blood vessel. And if you remember back to our first histology class, uh, you can recall the endothelial cells there in the kidney papilla and when we learned about the uh, uh, simple squamous epithelium, we mentioned endothelium as uh, simple squamous epithelial lining of the blood vessels. Uh, as endothelial cells are epithelial cells, we have a basal lamina and then depending on the, on the size of the blood vessel, we can have very thin or uh, uh, thicker subendothelial connective tissue. The media contains smooth muscle and connective tissue fibers and ground substance and it, it depends which type of blood vessel, the ratio can be very different between smooth muscle cells and fibers. And the uh, adventitia is loose connective tissue Many times we hear that adventitia is dense connective tissue, which is a big mistake. It's not a small mistake, it's a big mistake. Uh, because um, if it was dense connective tissue, then the uh, blood vessel could not dilate. And then the whole function would be lost. So this is important that you remember it's loose connective tissue with all the typical components of the loose connective tissue. Bigger vessels have even vessels supplying the vessels. These are called vasa vasorum. These are the vessels of the vessels, word by word. So let's see the types of vessels that we're going to discuss. Uh, the heart, from the heart leaves the aorta as the biggest, the main artery. And uh, then it's followed by all the other uh, arteries which all belong to the muscular uh, group of arteries and then the smallest uh, vessels on the arterial side are called arteriole 
and then we reach the capillaries where there is the exchange of gases and nutrients to the tissues <coughs> and then the venous side uh, where the blood returns to the heart first venules, these are the smallest, then medium and large veins. If we compare arteries and veins, you can immediately see that there is a big difference in the structure of the wall. In the arteries, the main layer is the tunica media, in the veins, the adventitia. The media is very muscular, is more muscular in the arteries than in the veins, so uh, in general, we can say that uh, arteries have thicker wall and more muscular wall and so the uh, deformation of the vessel is not that easy. In veins, uh, they have a thinner wall with more connective tissue and less muscle, so it can be more easily deformed. So many times in the slide you can see that the very deformed structure is more likely the vein, but of course in these typical examples you can easily see the difference in thickness and in composition and in form. It's not always that easy, but here you can see it clearly. So let's see the arteries first. Uh, basically we have two basic types of arteries, the elastic type and the muscular type of arteries. Elastic type is basically the aorta and the beginning portion of its main branches and as the name suggests we have in the tunica media elastic fibers and smooth muscle cells in the aorta, so in the elastic type of artery, elastic fibers dominate but we also have, of course, in the media, smooth muscle. This is the slide that you have already seen when you studied the um, elastic fibers. This was stained with orsin. Orsin is the specific staining for elastic fibers. And you can see uh, many, many, many layers of elastic fibers. This is now, you know, the tunica media of the aorta. In the muscular type of arteries, the smooth muscle cells dominate. We have less fibers, they are mainly confined to the outer and inner border of the tunica media. So let's start with the aorta first. Here again, the slide that you are already familiar with, with or say only the elastic fibers are stained. So this is a specific staining for the elastic fibers and you can see the media and the adventitia. Adventitia is loose connective tissue and as such it contains some elastic fibers so of course it is also stained but more faintly. The intima is very thin or not even visible uh, with orsain stain. And this is the slide with hematoxylin eosin. So this is a new slide uh, now but you're going to see again the orsain stained slide. Here you can clearly see the three layers, intima media and adventitia, and you can see that there are three different layers. Uh, intima is thin, and if you go to high magnification, you can see the endothelial cells, so simple squamous cells on top, and then you see the media. If you go to high magnification, you can see that in this layer we have smooth muscle cells, and between the smooth muscle cell, uh, cells and nuclei, you can see the, uh, the very wavy uh, and eosinophilic lines. These are the elastic fibers. This picture is very typical. Unfortunately, the slide, the aorta slide, is many times not recognized or mixed with other slides. And if you suspect uh, the aorta, go to high magnification in this layer. And this is a very typical picture between smooth muscle cells, elastic fibers, that can only be the aorta. And then the adventitia is loose connective tissue, it's nothing special really. You can see arteries and nerves supplying the vessel wall. The arteries are called vasa vasorum, as I already said. The next question is how these elastic fibers are oriented, organized and what is their function. They are organized in fenestrated membranes 
it means that there are many, many, many layers of elastic membranes, elastic fibers, uh, 30 to 70 layers, and there are fenestry, little windows, fenestra means window, little uh, uh, slits between them, so this also allows diffusion of nutrients. And what is the function? The function is the so-called wind castle effect, wind castle effect. This makes like a reserve. Uh, so when the heart pumps the blood to the aorta, because of its elasticity, it dilates. And during diastole, when there is no blood coming from the heart to the aorta, then it goes back to its original size because of its elasticity. And uh, this enables continuous blood flow. This is very important because without this mechanism, the blood supply would be uh, cyclic. But uh, because of its, uh, of its elasticity, uh, the blood flow can be continuous. So because of the elastic fibers, there is a reserve, like a wind castle, uh, a reserve formed. This is a very important mechanism. So let's see a disease that you also heard about when you did the connective tissue fibers, Marfan syndrome, and you learned all the elastic um, symptoms because of the uh, um, two loose elastic fibers. And one of the uh, very important symptoms which can unfortunately cause death of these patients many times is exactly the aneurysm of the aorta. So because the aorta contains a lot of elastic fibers because of its structure, the disease affects the wall of the aorta as well. And then there can be these uh, sac-like uh, uh, widenings of the wall. This is called aneurysm. And of course, rupture of the aorta aneurysm can lead to uh, very severe bleedings causing death so these patients are endangered uh, due to the aorta aneurysm. So not to mix with the uh, uh, other slides, many times unfortunately we hear this in exam that students identify the aorta slide either connective tissue, dense connective tissue or smooth muscle or even cartilage and cardiac muscle. Uh, first of all, when you get this slide, uh, look at the layers, that this is a layered organ. It's part of the wall of something. And then uh, this layer, the adventitia, is nothing special, it's loose connective tissue. The main and very typical layer, what I showed you, is the media, where if you go to high magnification or you zoom in, uh, you can uh, find the smooth muscle cells and the elastic fibers which is very, very typical. So let's go on to the next group of arteries, which is the muscular type of arteries. So we have less and less uh, fibers and more and more muscle. Most of the arteries belong to this group uh, where the tunica media is the dominating layer and that contains smooth muscle cells, very compact. So. Uh, near each other and the elastic fibers are confined only to the boundaries. Intima media border it's called internal elastic membrane. This is stronger and more and thicker and more heavily stained of course with orsin or with uh, eosin. It's eosinophilic and media adventitia border with yellow arrows. Uh, it shows the uh, external elastic membrane. It's not as expressed as the internal one. This is another typical feature of the arteries. As you can see, as we go down the uh, circulation tree, uh, we can find uh, mid-sized and small arteries. And here you can see the sizes. Above 10, we call it large arteries. Uh, mid-sized, uh, 2 to 10 millimeters, and small arteries. 100 micrometer to 2 millimeters. And in English, uh, we can call these arteries also distributing arteries, which helps you to remember the function. 
This is a very uh, common mistake in the exam when we ask why is it good that the arteries have such a muscular wall? What is the function of this muscle in the tunica media? So the function is not to pump the blood. This is a very common mistake that we hear in the exam. It is not. It's the function of the heart to pump the blood, not of the arteries. To continue this thought, it could be that, okay, if this pumps the blood, then what happens when it relaxes? Then blood flow would stop. So, of course, it doesn't make any sense. The function is exactly the name shows you the distribution of blood. If this muscle wall relaxes, if there is vasodilation, then there is more blood flowing to that area. So the blood supply increases. If this muscle contracts, then the lumen is smaller, less blood flows to the area. And of course, through that, uh, resistance and blood pressure are regulated as well. And uh, you will hear in other subjects a lot about diseases of the blood vessels, arteriosclerosis, when the lumen gets smaller and smaller and so the blood supply of that area is compromised and this can, how this can be helped. Uh, you will uh, learn it in detail with the balloon catheter or stents. And uh, finally, we reached the last part of the arterial side and these are the smallest of uh, this part of the tree is the arteriole. The arterioles are uh, between 10 and 100 micrometers and it co they contain one, two or three, maximum three layers of smooth muscle cells. Here you can see the type which contains only one smooth muscle. So this is just one step before the capillaries come. And so these are called pre-capillary arterioles. You will learn in physiology in detail that these are very important uh, parts of the um, circulation in, uh, to determine peripheral resistance, to really determine what and how much blood is flowing to a certain area. And because it contains, the atrial contains smooth muscle cells and it's very small, it cannot be easily compressed because it's very small, uh, you can see in the slide almost always there's very nice round structures. Uh, here you can see two examples. Uh, the first layer is always the endothelial cell and then the smooth muscle cell, so you can easily recognize the arterioles. And as I said already, vasodilation and vasoconstriction is the dilation and constriction of the vessels and there are a lot of factors determining it. You will uh, learn it in physiology, pathophysiology, very much in detail later. And uh, then we go to the capillary uh, part, which is basically the root uh, con connection between arterioles and venules. But there can be in some places a direct connection between arterioles and venules, and these are called arteriovenous anastomosis. So finally we reached the capillaries and these are very thin walled uh, vessels where we have the exchange of gases, nutrients, so basically the supply of the tissues happens here and it's a very profusely branching network. Uh, the most common type of capillaries is the so-called continuous capillary which you can see in this picture showing the general features of a capillary. So of course we have endothelial cells. In most capillaries, nothing else. Uh, sometimes we find, not sometimes, many times, but not everywhere, we find pericytes, which are other cells surrounding the capillary. I will show you in a second. And of course the endothelial cell has a basal lamina. Sometimes we find reticular fibers around and in continuous capillaries we have tight junction between the cells. Here you can see uh, it's very easy to remember the size because you can see one red blood cell, so it's approximately the size of one red blood cell, a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger can be, that's why the 5 to 10 or 5 to 15 is easy to remember. If you see 20 
red blood cells, it cannot be a normal capillary, it could be a sinusoid capillary, I will show you in a second. So, types of capillaries, and uh, this is a question that comes up many, many times. What types of capillaries do you know? And then, uh, many times the answer from the student is, what do you mean? And then we repeat the question, what types, what groups of capillaries do you know? So this is a question many times students cannot answer, that's why I emphasize it. So this graph shows the types of capillaries. We have the three main types, also shown uh, here, uh, but basically the same and easier picture is found here. We have continuous, most capillaries belong to this group. We have fenestrated and sinusoid capillaries. Continuous capillaries, what I already uh, said in detail, fenestrated have small fenestrae in the cells and sinusoid capillaries have intercellular fenestrae, intercellular holes and are bigger than normal capillaries. So let's see in detail, continuous capillaries, as I said, these are the most common types of capillaries. They have a continuous endothelial wall and a continuous basal lamina. And they can be found in many tissues, in most tissues basically, in muscle, in connective tissue, a special type, but continuous capillaries found in the brain. And here you can see the electromicroscopic picture. These are the endothelial cells and this is a parasite. The next group is the fenestrated capillary, which contains intracellular pores, uh, little intracellular fenestrae, fenestra means window. So uh, these pores enable the capillary to have very, very intense uh, fluid transport, which is typical in, in the organs where we have absorption or reabsorption uh, in the intestine and in the kidney. The third group is the sinusoid capillaries or also called discontinuous capillaries or just simply sinuses you can also say these are much bigger than normal capillaries 10 to 100 micrometer and they have pores between the cells and also the basal lamina is discontinuous and um, here you can see uh, only endothelial cells nothing else in the wall but much bigger than a capillary more red blood cells and uh, this enables exchange of big molecules, hormones, when we have a very, very intense endocrine glands, very intensely produce hormones and send it to the circulation <coughs> and secrete to the blood endocrine glands and or in the liver where we have exchange of big molecules and very intense. And we can also have exchange of cells where in the bone marrow, the newly born the newly produced blood cells are sent to the circulation, like in the bone marrow. This is a slide we have this year, so this semester you have to know the signs of capillaries only in the bone marrow. And uh, in the spleen we have very intensive transport also, cells leave the circulation. Few words about endothelial cells, so here you can see in in uh, longitudinal here in cross section, always the first layer of blood vessels. And besides the barrier function, they have several other functions, metabolic function, they produce the basal lamina, uh, they produce important factors for angiogenesis, so the building of the blood vessel itself, and uh, they secrete factors that are responsible for the tone or even clotting, blood clotting. Hemangioma is a tumor of the endothelial cells. And I already mentioned that some capillaries are surrounded by pericytes, pericytes. They have processes and they can differentiate into many other types of uh, cells. They play a very important role in angiogenesis, so building of blood vessels. Uh, and they also produce uh, factors important for tone and vasoactive factors. A few words about angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means the building of the blood vessels 
and of course besides physiology physiological circumstances it's extremely important in tumor growth uh, uh, malignant tumors can grow only if they have a very good blood supply and the better blood supply they have the faster they grow and the faster they give metastasis and so it is extremely important to try to stop this and uh, some of the uh, uh, therapeutical agents are actually aiming to stop angiogenesis, inhibit angiogenesis of tumors. Uh, one main factor is VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Uh, it's enough at this point if you remember this one factor which is very important for the growth of blood vessels. Here I just show you some pictures of capillaries. Uh, this is our, from our slide of kidney papilla. Uh, our first slide and here you can see the endothelial cells, the nuclei and some other examples. Lesions of the capillaries uh, typically cause these very small uh, point-like bleedings. So now we can go to the venous side and here we basically have the small, very small ones called venules and then small, mid-size and big veins. They are much thinner than the arteries and uh, venules, uh, one category is the post-capillary venule, like in the arterioles we had the pre-capillary arteriole, just one step before the capillary. This is just one step after the capillary. It's called post-capillary venule when there is only the endothelial cell lining, nothing else. A uh, little bit bigger venules can be up to 100 micrometer with a little uh, connective tissue around. And um, other veins, in other veins, the main layer is the tunica adventitia. The media has smooth muscle, but less smooth muscle than in the arteries, not so densely packed uh, as in the arteries, and uh, thinner. The whole thing is thinner, and the adventitia is usually the main layer. But here you have to remember that veins can be very different depending on from which part of the body we have the vein. We have very muscular veins too, uh, from areas uh, uh, like you will see the, um, or you have already seen the um, umbilical cord, there we have a more muscular vein. So it very much depends on the body part we have the vein from. Here are uh, some special features which allow continuous blood flow in the veins. You will learn in physiology that the blood pressure is very low on the vein side. So uh, to lead the blood back to the heart, especially like from the lower limb, when the veins have to act against gravity too, uh, is a very tricky thing and we can have a lot of problems from this. Uh, here you can see some features which enable the blood flow in the right direction. You can see that um, uh, veins have valves. Here you can see the valves. Many valves we have in the lower limb veins which uh, allow blood flow only in one direction. So uh, the, here you can see valves with micros with uh, uh, the histological structure showing that they are uh, made from the intima, preventing backflow. Other factors enabling blood flow, veins, especially the bigger veins, can have longitudinal smooth muscle cells in the tunica adventitia. So longitudinal smooth muscle cells allow and help uh, the blood flow. This is typical only in veins, in arteries we don't have this. Uh, and the skeletal muscle surrounding the vein from outside the movement of the muscle helps pumping the blood and the valves enable blood flow only in one direction. And the lower limb, especially the crural region, has a very, very tight fascia, which also prevents the uh, uh, dilation of the veins, abnormal dilation. If these mechanisms do not function properly, then we can see that there can be abnormal dilation of the veins uh, this is called varicosity of the veins or if the blood flow is not insured we can have uh, blood clotting and 
uh, this is called venous thrombosis of course one of the main sites for this is exactly the lower limb for the reasons i just told you so here you can see a comparison again of arteries and veins and uh, you can uh, see that these are all examples where we can compare arteries and veins or an artery or in the venue next to each other many times they 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 run together so when in many slides you can see next to each other an artery and the vein and uh, here you can see that the artery has a nicer shape more muscular wall a thicker tunica intima uh, tunica media sorry and a much thinner adventitia in the vein uh, the tunica media is thinner the wall is more deformed it's not always like this but in this example it's like this or here too and the adventitia is uh, thicker and in the media if we could see it with high magnification we would see that there is less uh, like here less densely packed smooth muscle cells in the artery the smooth muscle cells are very densely packed uh, here we have smooth muscle of course but not as densely packed and not so thick is the whole layer and just a few words about lymph vessels at the end because they are also vessels so they also have endothelial lining and you do not have to recognize at this point in the slide uh, the lymph vessels but you should know that they transport extracellular fluid back to veins and the structure is similar to the same sized veins it's a little bit thinner even here you can see some uh, examples and at the end the big lymph ducts lead the lymph the extracellular fluid back to the vein system so with this i would like to thank you for the attention